So now that we've spent a lot of time talking about different ways to sample a continuous time signal, we want to turn our attention now to how we can reconstruct a continuous time signal from its samples. So one way to think about this is, let's say I have some impulse sampled signal. I would like to run that through some filter or some type of linear system to get back to my original continuous time signal. We want to reconstruct the continuous time signal from its samples. So people call this different things. Some people call it interpolation. Some people call it signal reconstruction. There are different things to call it, but the main goal is to undo the sampling process to get back to our original signal. Because the whole premise has been, we want to start with a continuous time signal and get down to this kind of list of numbers that captures all the information. If all the information is really there, we should be able to take that information and get back to where we started. And if we can do that, we feel good that the sampling process hasn't removed any information or we haven't lost any information in that sampling process. So that's kind of, it raises an interesting question. What guarantees us that our samples let us do this? As kind of a cartoon example, let's think about this continuous time um, or this set of samples right here, these dots right here. Let's say I gave you just this list of numbers and you plotted all these samples. There are lots of different ways that you could connect the dots, so to speak. One way is this solid line. I could run my um, a line through these samples and create this signal. And I could say, wow, this solid line is the original signal x1 of t because it goes through all these samples very smoothly. But then somebody else could come along and they could draw this dashed line. They could say, this dashed line, x2 of t, is what I think the original signal looked like because it goes through all of those samples and it's a nice smooth function. And I think that's what the original signal looked like. So in that case, you know, who is right? Given just a list of samples, how do we know which signal goes through the samples? Here I just drew an x1 of t and an x2 of t, but you could also, you know, find another smooth curve that goes through these samples as well. So what guarantees us that given a set of samples, there's just one signal that goes through these samples correctly? So what we need to do is we need to understand the conditions for unique reconstruction, meaning given a list of samples, there's just one signal that goes through them correctly. And then we need to figure out um, how we're actually going to do the reconstruction. So first of all, we need to understand what ensures a unique reconstruction. And then once we know what that condition is, we'll actually go ahead and figure out how to do the reconstruction. So let's first, though, talk about what ensures unique reconstruction. And unique reconstruction is just a fancy way for saying there's just one signal that can go through these samples, and there's only one, not a whole bunch of them. So the unique condition is the sampling theorem. And we can reason through it as follows, and basically we can just picture some of the things that we've been sketching in the frequency domain. First of all, everything we've ever done with frequency domain representation, we've always had this nice one-to-one -one correspondence. If I gave you some signal x of t, and I told you to compute the Fourier transform, well, that's what you'd do, and you would get x of omega. Or if I gave you x of omega and said, tell me what x of t is, you would go compute that. And the way you computed both of those was with either the Fourier transform or the inverse Fourier transform. So we've always had this one-to-one -one correspondence. Something in the time domain could be equivalently represented in the frequency domain, or something in the frequency domain, you could go to the time domain, and as you went back and forth, these things were just paired up perfectly. During the sampling process, we need to make sure that we preserve this one-to-one -one correspondence. And from all the pictures that we've been sketching, you can tell that this happens as long as we sample fast enough. When we sample fast enough, the original spectrum, often sketched as a triangle in the last set, um, few videos, that triangle shows up in the sampled spectrum. We can always see that triangle. However, if we don't sample fast enough, we don't see the triangle. We end up seeing either a distorted triangle or triangles kind of stacked on top of each other. Another way of saying that is when we sample too slow, aliasing occurs. When aliasing occurs, the triangle shapes collide in the frequency domain and we can no longer see the original spectrum that we were working with. Another way of saying it is that when we sample incorrectly and aliasing occurs, 
the one-to-one -one correspondence between time and frequency gets destroyed. So the key thing here is we need to maintain this one-to-one -one correspondence, and what that really means is we cannot let aliasing occurs. When aliasing occurs, we get a collision of the original spectrum with its images in the frequency domain, and all that information gets um, destroyed, essentially. So that brings us to a formal definition of the sampling theorem. The sampling theorem says, hey, we've got some continuous time signal x of t, which has a Fourier transform x of omega, and we're going to assume that it's a band-limited signal. All the uh, kind of cartoons we've been doing are band have been band-limited signals, and that means that it, the spectrum goes to zero at some frequency. So in all the pictures we've been sketching, we've been able to find some max frequency such that above omega m, the spectrum is zero. So in the triangle shape we've been sketching, when that triangle hits zero, it's zero then for all frequencies. The sampling theorem says as long as we sample at greater than two times this largest frequency, so two times omega m, then we can uniquely determine x of t, the continuous time signal, from its samples. So that is a formal statement of the sampling theorem. It says when you sample, you need to sample at twice the largest frequency or greater, and then the samples that you get uniquely determine the original continuous time signal. So this is what we're wanting, this unique correspondence between x of t and its samples. So one thing that's interesting here about the sampling theorem is it gives us a lower bound. It tells us you need to sample at two times omega m or greater. So typically, um, as you sample more and more, that requires more memory on your hard drive to store these samples off. So there's usually a trade-off between wanting to sample a lot, but also not wanting to have to store a lot of data to disk. When you sample at the lower bound, so at the lower bound would be at two times omega m, that would be the slowest you should ever sample, and that exact sampling rate is what is called the Nyquist rate. And we've actually mentioned that rate a few times in the preceding videos. The Nyquist rate is two times the largest frequency of the signal, and it's the minimum sampling rate required by the sampling theorem. So we should never sample a signal lower than two times omega m. And as usual, if you don't like working in radial frequencies, we can always go to um, linear frequencies by just dividing a radial frequency by 2 pi. All right, so let's see what this means. We have this sampling theorem that tells us the bound on how to sample. Let's go ahead and work a few examples in the next video with very specific signals and figuring out and figure out what the sampling rates for these signals are based on the sampling theorem. And then after we do that, then we'll turn our attention to how do we actually go about reconstructing a signal from its samples. But at this point, we've established the criteria that will allow us to perfectly reconstruct a signal from its samples, and this criterion is the sampling theorem.